Hello. I'm going to talk about interpreting games. Um, lots of things have depth to them. In sci-fi, a good book, a good sci-fi book, is not about whatever it appears to be about. What happens is you have this thing in the real world that you want to examine, like slavery or xenophobia or religion so you take it out of the real world and you cut all of its bonds to the real world and you stretch it out and you put it in a fake world where you can discuss it without anyone getting really upset uh, or bored or whatever you can separate it from all of the real world judgments that are attached to it or some of the real world judgments that are attached to it put it in a fake world examine it there do a lot of work with it and that's why so many science fiction books hold together really really well they're about something um, the core of their story is driven by something that actually existed when the writer was writing. Uh, so, can you, get that, can you do that in a game? Well, games are almost always written on the surface. Um, there are, as far as I know, almost no games which are actually about something besides what they appear to be about. Uh, the, no game is ever written to have a deeper meaning than it actually has, um, or than it appears to have. But, when you write a game, you end up embedding a lot of stuff in it. You embed a lot of yourself, you embed a lot of genre tropes, you embed a lot of judgments and culture. Uh, and that stuff ends up embedded in the game world in much the same way as if you'd done it on purpose. So, when you analyze a game, you're not assigning it more value. You're not assigning it thoughts it didn't have. You're looking at the culture that created the game, and you are saying, this is what the culture contains. So, you're able to see the pieces of the real world that have been embedded in the fake world. And I'm going to do that now with Breeder. Breeder is a tiny little Ichio game about three generations of kids who uh, each discover that their basement is full of eldritch abomination. We'll play as Marty. Now Marty is going to go ahead and discover this eldritch abomination, but before we do, I wanted to make it super clear that this is not about eldritch abominations. Um, even if it's by accident, this is very clearly about schizophrenia. I mean, if you wrote this up as a short story and you passed it out in, in a literature class, they would say this is too clearly about schizophrenia. You need to make it more about alien monsters and less about schizophrenia. So that's the sort of thing we're talking about here. So Marty starts off in this, uh, in this house and it's uh, not very interesting to him and he has kind of a bad life. And so he crawls into his closet and when he gets out of his closet, He's in another place. Where is he? Well, he's in his house. He's in his house, but it's not really his house. It just looks like his house. It's actually a replica of his house. Something has created a replica of his house, and he's trapped in it. He can't, he can't find a way out of this replica of his house. And on the walls are these patterns, and he thinks he can open these patterns. He thinks these patterns lead somewhere, but they don't. But he knows that one of them must, so he goes all around this fake house looking at the patterns on the walls. One of them one of them must contain some kind of, of secret. One of them must be able to uh, be opened. And, of course, in the concept of the game, in the game's reality, Marty has fallen into a labyrinth. He's in a real labyrinth dominated, dominated by a real Eldritch Horror. But Eldritch Horror games have all, or Eldritch Horror everything, it's not just games, have always been about mental illness. They were pioneered by people who were trying to deal with their mental illness, and even to this day they are still about mental illness. The Eldritch Horror itself doesn't exist. It's, it's just a, a stand-in for whatever mental illness you're talking about today. And in this case, he explores a lot. He explores all over the house, and he eventually reaches a dead end deep in the depths of this labyrinth. It's a dead end, and this is the only place he can actually open. But I wanted to point out to you that it is actually um, the passenger side of the car. <laughs> so, after wandering his house for who knows how long, staring at patterns on the wall, trying to open patterns on the wall, he goes through a door at his car. And uh, I think that's pretty clear that... Um, I. I it, Maybe it's an accident. Maybe he accidentally strongly implied that his parents put him in the car and drove him to a mental ward. But either way, when he goes through this door, he doesn't go home. He goes into a small cell, and in this small cell, he tries to figure out what the sacred words are, what these, what these power words are. He's got to arrange them in a formula. He's got to figure out the words that will uncover the secrets, that will, un that will show what is deeper. 
And when he uncovers the word, he can go deeper, he can go deeper, he can go deeper, he can go back home. But this is not his house. There are secrets here, more secrets than ever before. And, uh, and of course, in the game's reality, he is now discovering that the house has eldritch abominations in the basement. Um, from the perspective of our theory that he is, in fact, a, uh, having an event, having a psychotic episode, or a delusional episode, um, he's very clearly uh, falling deeper into his, into his delusions. And when you go through this last door, this final door, you end up in this room where there are geometries drawn on the floor. And if you follow these geometries, you follow them to the center, you find that in the center of the geometries is a secret. There's a monster that lives here, and it controls you, and it controls your family, and there's whispering everywhere. You hear the whispering voices. Maybe you can't because it's turning the game down. When you examine it, it says, you always knew, you always knew that there was something down here controlling everything. And I bet your father knows. You should go talk to your father. But you can't. Um, you are stuck in this room. There is no exit. Uh, this character cannot leave this room ever. Uh, it's pretty clearly a, uh, um, a stand-in for his mental, it's a representation for his mental illness. And he's stuck in here. He cannot escape. When you go to the future and you talk to him, he is actually in the real world, and he's, you know, a full-grown man, but he was, he refuses to talk about, refuses to talk about anything other than his delusions. So, I don't think that the developer intended to make this a game about schizophrenia, even though it is very clearly a game about schizophrenia. Uh, I think that he was just intending to make it a game about discovering these things in your basement, and uh, it ended up being about schizophrenia. And as I mentioned, that can happen, because what happens is you assemble these pieces. You go out into the world that exists, the real world, and you look at the genres, and you look at your life experiences, and you look at your culture, and you grab the pieces that fit together, and you put them in this game world. So what he did is he went into this uh, horror, this uh, eldritch abomination genre, and he grabbed various pieces that seemed to fit together, and they did. They fit together very well. And when we examine it, we can clearly see that the genre has been having this discussion for a while. And that's no surprise. This is not some secret that I'm discovering. Um, this is pretty well, pretty well known that the uh, eldritch horror genre is actually about mental illness. It was pioneered by people who were severely mental Ill, mentally ill and were um, writing stories driven by that illness. Uh, later on, it had a lot of stories of uh, people who, who either were mentally ill or were trying to talk about mental illness gravitated to the same genre because it echoed these same concerns and so this conversation has been ongoing since the 1900s um, and that's fine that's what a genre does it has this kind of conversation science fiction exists to have this kind to have a different kind of conversation about societal um, and and humanistic uh, realities whereas the cosmic horror genre talks about mental illnesses each genre has its own little discussions and people gravitate to the genre which is talking about the things that matter to them and I'm not saying that that's like 100% everything there are lots of cosmic horror stories that are just very flatly about cosmic horror and they don't have any concept of, of uh, deep conversations about madness or anything like that uh, and there are sci-fi stories which are just about people shooting laser guns um, so it's not like all of the genre always must discuss these things it's just that that's what it tends to be and if you look at the original Cthulhu mythos, you can clearly see that already emerging. Lovecraft was quite ill, and he created the Innsmouth people, these half-fish people, but they weren't about being half-eldritch horrors or half-abominations of the sea. He was thinking of a different kind of abomination because he was a real racist jerk, and he was actually uh, very, very... Um, panicked about the idea that he might be some fraction like 116th or 132nd African. And uh, that's why that story is written the way it is. So that's the sort of uh, genre that this is. And this game, whether on accident or on purpose, has put together the pieces that talk about schizophrenia in specific. Now, this is not a game that will be remembered as having deep insights into schizophrenia. It's a small game, and games are not the best place to discuss schizophrenia, but uh, this is still worthy of looking at in this light. And you might be thinking, oh, come on, you're thinking about this way too deeply. Games are just games. Um, but by examining games, we can find a lot of the things that culture has to say about itself. 
uh, and people have to say about themselves. We can get a lot closer to what people think uh, and don't realize they're thinking and what people do without realizing that that's what they're doing. A good example of that is uh, Bioshock Infinite. There are a lot of things to analyze in that game. Um, there's a lot of implicit uh, uh, racism and sexism and all sorts of other seriously problematic content, but also the game is very clearly about a homeless man who is suffering from severe delusions. Um, and that sounds kind of depressing. Oh, you're trying to make this game about homeless guys. That's so... St you're kind of ruining the game. You're trying to ruin the game. Um, but that's kind of the opposite of the truth. Uh, the, the fact that we can take something like uh, a homeless man who, uh, who is obviously uh, just not treated, perhaps because we didn't cover it, the things that sort of conversation where we can talk about that kind of really depressing real world stuff we can remove it from the real world and we can put it into a different world and we don't have to talk about it directly we can have this conversation where instead of talking about a homeless guy um, we can talk about a hero we can talk about uh, a man who struggles against these odds these uh, these odds that are impossible and overcomes them um, and therefore no one says, oh, it's about a homeless guy. Uh, um, you can talk about whatever you need to talk about in this way. I don't think that was the intent with Bioshock Infinite. Uh, Ken Levine is not anywhere near that insightful. Um, but it still ended up being about that. And if you look at the game with the idea that it is in fact about a homeless guy suffering from delusions, you can see that it is clearly about a homeless guy suffering from delusions. Virtually every single element of the game uh, is very, very easy to interpret in that way. Um, you are driven away by everyone. There is a religious organization that controls the island and controls you. Um, there are monsters that only come out when no one else is around. Your daughter, there are, there are clones of your daughter. There's 800 of your daughter. Uh, there are lots of different yous, for that matter. Uh, and you can see things when your daughter is around. Um, the world sh the world doesn't look the same anymore. Uh, there's all sorts of little details, both in the gameplay and in the world design, that clearly indicate that, that the main character is just delusional. Does that ruin the game? Hmm. I don't think so. As I said, I think it's a great way to talk about something no one wants to talk about. Anyway, uh, all that aside, I'm still kind of sick, so I'm sorry if this came off as a little bit more boring and scratchy voiced as I had hoped, but those are my thoughts on analyzing games. Uh, you don't have to analyze games. If you are perfectly happy with taking games as they are, that's fine. If you have never thought about science fiction as being about some real-world topic, that's fine. These are things you can enjoy uh, without having to read into them. Just keep in mind that a lot of us do read into them, and if you hear us talking about these sorts of things, they're not necessarily invalid concerns. They're not necessarily us assigning things to these games or these stories that don't exist. They are just that we are approaching it from a different angle, and we're trying to learn more about the culture that created it, the people that created it. Um, so, thanks for your time.